This is the story of American Airlines Flight 1400. On the 20th of September 2007, an American Airlines DC-9 had to make the flight from St. Louis International Airport to Chicago O'Hare. The pilot showed up at the airport at about 11.40 a.m. Today, the captain would be the one in charge. Once in the cockpit, the captain started the engines. But just one problem, the left-hand engine did not light. The flight crew let the American maintenance staff know about the problem. The maintenance techs were ready to start the engine manually. As the pilots completed the before start checklist, the techs asked the captain to hold the engine start switch in the start position. As he did that, the techs opened the left engine's air turbine starter valve. This was an important step in the manual start procedure, but the captain saw no movement of the valve from his instruments in the cockpit. On attempt number two, the engine roared to life. Flight 1400 was good to go with 143 souls on board. As the plane taxied, the crew scanned the instruments. Nothing out of the ordinary. Nothing to trip them up. Whatever the problem was, it was long gone. The jet lined up with the runway, and the pilots pushed the engines to max power. The plane responded as it lurched forward, beginning its takeoff run. Flight 1400 was airborne within seconds, and it was climbing. As the altimeter ticked over to 1,000 feet, the first officer noted something. The air turbine starter valve, or the ATSV, was open on the left-hand engine. This was followed by the fire warning on the left-hand engine. Engine number one was on fire, and they needed to get on the ground as fast as possible. The captain immediately asked the first officer to declare an emergency and to let the controllers know that they were heading back to the airport. At 1.14 p.m., the first officer started with a fire suppression checklist on the left-hand engine. He pulled engine number one back to idle. To make sure that everyone was on the same page, the captain temporarily handed the plane over to the first officer while he briefed the cabin crew members about the emergency. If this was a serious fire, then every second after touchdown would be crucial in getting everyone off the plane alive. The cabin crew members would be crucial in doing that. After the captain brought everyone up to speed on what he was planning to do, he turned his attention back to the plane. When he was getting ready to take back control, he started to lose his electronics. His primary flight display and his navigational panels were now blank. At 1.17 p.m., the first officer was still battling the blaze. The fire warning light was still glowing bright red. He was trying to deploy the fire suppressants in the left-hand engine. He said, this will not discharge. Eventually, he got both fire bottles to discharge. The crew had just taken one step forward, but they were about to take two steps back. The first officer then realized that he had lost all electrical power in the cockpit. As the crew dropped the gear and configured the spoilers, the captain tried to start the APU, or the auxiliary power unit, to get back some of their electrical systems. But it would not start. They were flying this plane the old-fashioned way. With no power, the pilots had no idea if the gear was actually down. The pilots asked the St. Louis controller to check if the gear was down. The controller had bad news. The nose gear was up. They then made the gut-wrenching decision to go around. No pilot wants to spend a moment more in the air than he absolutely has to when there's a fire on board. With a fire, there's no telling when everything will fall apart, literally and figuratively. As the plane flew by, the controllers got a good look at the plane and the engine was blackened with soot. This was not a small fire. As the pilots climbed away, they asked an off-duty pilot in the cabin to help them out in the cockpit. With the newcomer taking a bit of the load off the captain, the captain could now think about how he'd put this burning bird on the ground. He knew that runway 30 left was 2,000 feet longer than runway 30 right, and with the state that the plane was in, he might need every inch of that runway. As the first officer performed the emergency gear extension checklist, the off-duty pilot noticed something scary. They were losing hydraulic pressure. He said, you've lost all hydraulic pressure on the right side. The first officer was shocked, and he replied with, how did that happen? With no time to waste, the first officer completed the emergency gear extension checklist. They still had no lights or signs to tell them if the gear was down and locked but they heard a low rumble that indicated that this time, the gear was in fact down. As the pilot struggled to keep the DC-9 in the air, 
The captain took stock of the situation. Here's a quote from him that perfectly summarizes the quagmire that they were in. We've got no left engine, we've got no right hydraulic pressure, and we don't have any hydraulics on the left side. Their plane was starting to fall apart around them. Somehow, the captain managed to maintain control of his plane. He brought the plane back down on runway 30 left. As soon as the plane came to a stop, the firefighters began smothering the engine with foam. As they did that, they used a thermal imager to look for any hot spots that were not visible to the naked eye. A firefighter found a really hot area near the engine. As the firefighters worked to ascertain the risk that the fire posed to all on board, the left-hand engine started to leak fuel. They were not taking any risks and evacuated everyone from the plane as soon as possible. To understand what happened to Flight 1400, we need to look at the JT-8D engines of the DC-9. All jet engines work on the same basic principle of suck, squeeze, bang, blow. You suck air in, compress it, add fuel, and let it burn. That's a gross oversimplification of a very complex system, but it will do. If you've seen a jet engine, you know that there's a turbine right up front. That turbine sucks in air, and then that air is mixed with fuel and then burnt. That thrust then turns the turbines inside the engines, which in turn turns the big turbine up front. The running engine, in a way, runs itself. Now you may ask, if that's the case, then how do you start an engine? That's where the ATS, or the air turbine starter, comes in. It's a small turbine that's connected to the core of the engine. High pressure air is directed to the ATS. This high pressure air spins up the ATS, which in turn spins up the entire core of the engine. Give it enough time and the ATS will have the engine at self-sustaining speeds in no time. Here's the important part though. The pneumatic high pressure air that spins the ATS is controlled by the ATSV, or air turbine starter valve, that we talked about before. It has to be open for the ATS to spin, which is why ground techs ask the pilots to open the valve. Now that you have a basic understanding of how the JT-8D starts up, let's look at what happened on flight 1400. When they tore the left-hand engine down, they found that the filter in the ATS valve was badly degraded. This filter was there to prevent particles from getting stuck in the inner workings of the valve. You don't want the valve to malfunction now, do you? These filters were supposed to be checked every so often during what are known as C-checks. The damage that they saw had been there for a very long time and would have been visible during a few of the previous C-checks. This led the investigators to believe that the mandated checks were not being carried out properly. Since the filter was not inspected, it got damaged, and the damaged filter had some far-reaching consequences for the engine and the plane as a whole. You see, in this engine, the filter material had degraded by about 70%. This meant that a small little metal bit, known as the end cap, was free to move about inside the housing that it was in. Since the end cap was free, it would sometimes block the airflow to the ATS valve. This meant that Depending upon the position of the loose end cap in the housing, the left-hand engine would just refuse to start because the end cap was blocking air from getting to the ATS. Without the air, the ATS wouldn't spin and the engine wouldn't start. Now, this was an intermittent problem that confused the techs. They were focusing on the wiring of the ATSV because that's where they thought the problem was. Moreover, there had been some issues with wiring in the past that they had experience with. No one expected there to be a problem with the air filter because no one had ever reported a problem with them. And even if they had known that the air filter was messed up, there was no procedure on how to handle that. But ultimately, the techs tried everything and they couldn't figure the problem out. So they decided to hit the built-in manual override switch that's in the ATSV. As the name suggests, Hitting the switch opens the valve, no questions asked. Here's what's interesting. You're supposed to hit that switch with your finger, but these guys use something pointy to hit the switch, which unknown to them caused the pin inside the switch to bend. The bent pin had disastrous consequences for the engine. It meant that the valve did not fully seal, which meant that hot high pressure air from the rest of the engine could make its way to the ATS turbine. 
The valve was designed to prevent exactly that, and it had failed. This high pressure air caused the ATS turbine to spin faster and faster until it failed. Now with the failed valve, you have really hot high pressure air surging into the ATS cavity. When I say hot, I mean really hot. We're talking about 600 to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 315 degrees Celsius to 1000 degrees Celsius for the rest of us. At those temperatures, the oil in the ATS gearbox caught fire. But let's be for real though, at those temperatures, what wouldn't burn? But the end result is the same. You have a jet engine that's on fire. Now that we know what happened, let's look at how the pilots reacted to the emergency. When they first got the ATSB open light in the cockpit, they failed to perform a valve open check before the fire warning came on. Then, once the fire warning came on, the captain failed to explicitly mention who would be doing what. This meant that the first officer was handling radios and also doing checklists. This meant that the first officer's critical checklists were interrupted by ATC communications, and at one point, the captain asked the first officer to fly as he needed to talk to the cabin crew members. The workload in the cockpit was so high that it meant that they were stuck doing non-critical tasks, and that kept them from getting to critical checklist items. I know it sounds like I'm just criticizing the pilots on and on, but this is in the report, and I just want to present that for the sake of completeness. In my opinion, these pilots, they did a fabulous job. The investigators had a few final questions for the pilots. They wanted to know why the captain went around. I mean, no pilot wants to spend any additional time in the air with a fire on board, unless absolutely necessary. Well, by the time that the captain knew that the nose gear was not down, it was too late to inform the crew, and he did not want to land without informing the crew. Moreover, Due to the electrical problems that they were having, the captain didn't really trust the fire warnings till the tower came on and said, yeah, you guys have a massive problem. In their report, the NTSB agreed with the captain. Performing a gear up landing without any preparation can be disastrous. So they could see why the captain did what he did. What do you think though? Do you think that the captain made the right call in going around? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.